Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Are holy places holy, or can they be downright weird, too? Can aliens leave things in your mouth if they abduct you? Has Bigfoot moved to the U.K.? Welcome to the 461st edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I'm Larry Lowe, sitting in for Ben Eno this evening. Well, Larry, it's great to have you back with us. Ben is still immersed in his summer course in Boston on Monday evenings, but even the summer courses must come to an end. He'll be back with us soon. Every week I say it's going to be two weeks, but this week he tells me it actually will be two weeks when he'll be back. Meanwhile, we're doing an open-line show on the extreme paranormal this evening with reports of the ultra-weird from, from around the world. And who better to accompany us than Larry Lowe, respected Arizona journalist, veteran aerospace writer, pilot, software engineer, and television and uh, radio presenter with over three decades of research into UFOs, other areas of the paranormal, shamanism, and the nature of consciousness. He has appeared on numerous television productions, including the National Geographic Channel investigation into the famous Phoenix Lights right in his own neighborhood. Larry's website? Larry, what's your, what, 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 what website do you want tell people about yeah the examiner.com okay slash ufo in phoenix slash larry low or just phoenix ufo examiner into google will get you there very good okay well let's get right to it folks uh, from our good friend lon strickler of parent i should say of phantoms and monsters.com comes the stuff that we do these extreme paranormal shows about and that is things that you thought once you thought you've heard everything, but you have not, and here goes the first one. The uh, first question we posed this evening uh, was really prompted by a report from the um, Grotto of Santa Rosalia. Uh, that's, of course, as you can guess, a near, actually, well, actually near Palermo in Sicily, part of Italy, of course, and Santa Rosalia or Saint. Rosalie, I guess it would be translated, is the patroness of not only Palermo, but also two cities in Venezuela for some reason. There are supposedly reports of all sorts of odd goings-on in the cave other than religious experiences. Strange photos of, of hooded figures, uh, people seeing things that really shouldn't be there. And, and uh, Larry, I'm reminded of, of many of the reports from... I suppose places like Fatima and other places that are well known as uh, situations where there were Marian apparitions, supposedly, and there were also a number of things that happened there that you didn't hear about. UFOs were reported in, in the area of Fatima, and also Lourdes, Yeti, or Bigfoot as we know it in this country, and also a lot of strange, what one might call, I suppose for lack of a better term, fairy phenomena. If you go back before Christian times, many of these areas were associated by the pagans with the appearances of fairies or whatever odd creatures you're talking about here. So what say you on that? Well, I just uh, did a little bit of homework. Rosalia was uh, born of a noble family, and uh, she was born in 1130 and died in 1166. And in 1624, a plague haunted Palermo, and during this hardship, she started to appear to sick people. So this goes back a long way. There's been a lot of sightings at this cave where she actually went to live because uh, she was going to give her, devote her life to her, her version of God. Um, and then after she died, centuries after she died, she started appearing to people. Mm -hmm. So you get, you get a lot of this kind of stuff around, and it's, it's, it's easy to sort of put it in this religious mysticism. I don't know how do they prove what they saw. No one's got it any evidence mode. It's easy to be skeptical about it, I guess. But on the other hand, does it seem like there's a lot of that goes on? Well, that's true. And before I continue commenting here, I wanted to, I always, Ben always tells me, I always forget to give the phone number here. We do accept calls. A lot of people think we don't. It is locally 401 Seven six six one two four zero, and from anywhere in the U.S. and Canada, eight hundred four four nine one two four zero. But continuing on that theme, uh, th there have been. I'm always struck, Larry, by of course our, our background is pretty much. Uh, at least I started out sort of in ghost research uh, many many years ago when I was in the seminary, and I was always struck. You know, how come certain apparitions are considered 
I suppose, for lack of a better term, sort of holy or divine or, or that of some saint, whereas many people would report seeing loved ones uh, appearing and even other people reporting friends. I mean, how come they weren't considered holy? I, I don't know. Maybe it depended on the context. I don't know. I think it depends a lot upon the, the belief system of the individual. If Very true. If somebody they don't know, then they're going, and it is paranormal, and it's outside their normal experience. If they're deeply religious, they're going to assume this is a religious experience. Well, Whereas you're right. Your, your yeah. mom, it's, well, okay, that's her ghost. No, I agree, and it certainly depends on the culture as well. One of the uh, one of the rare exceptions to that, and the usual situation is that is that say uh, Christians of the Western tradition, such as people in Italy mostly, uh, would see, I suppose, saints and miracles that reflect the Western point of view, which is pretty much which concentrates on the sufferings of of Jesus in that case, whereas Eastern Christians where the tradition concentrates more on the resurrection of Christ. It's not that one was right or wrong, it's just how it developed. Uh, the, the miracles that take place there tend to be more resurrectional rather than suffering. Now, there's very little blood and more myrrh and good stuff like that. Um, pagans have uh, separate miracles. I, I talked to someone uh, who knew someone who was healed of cancer, they, they claimed, at Abydos, at the, the Temple of Isis there. Uh, be, uh, with the water in, in the, uh, well, I guess it's known as the Assyrian in that part of that temple. Obviously, it's, it's a non-functional temple. It's a Muslim country, and they, they don't quite go in for ISIS, but, but this, uh, this apparently uh, was reported at that time. And things of this kind, of course, really depending on the, the culture of the people involved. So I don't know. It's either the people put God where they want him or God takes people where you are. I don't know. Well, I think it boils down to my notions that we're dealing with a phenomenon of consciousness itself. Yep. And part of the interpretation of the phenomenon is going to be run through a set of filters inside the, inside the witness. And I, I would point out that in 2009, um, a, a group of people uh, came across what they call a black hooded figure. There's other things that have been seen in this particular location, some of them rather disturbing. Yeah. Uh, and many people might, you know, well versed in the in the lore, would go, "Oh, I know, it's it's uh, Santa Rosalia," but somebody else might perceive something completely different, and that's what makes it, investigating all of this, you know, very difficult. Mm-hmm. No, it's true. It's uh, very subjective, but uh, I don't know. It, it's, it's perhaps a sub- subjective uh, area of, of of human life in the first place. Because uh, I, I, I want to get to that discussion on consciousness, because um, uh, you're, you can talk about that in, in brilliant ways that I really we really enjoy. But in any way, in any case, I want to get this thing in the mouths here. They, they, I've heard of this on one or two occasions: people waking up with strange things in their mouths. And Lon Strickler, whom I mentioned earlier, is is a fellow who sort of associates that. He said it, it could have been something left over from an abduction experience. And your particular background, Larry, has a lot to do with the UFO research, so I, I, know, I was curious what you had to say about this. But let me just uh, read part of this thing. And again, this is from Lon's uh, site, uh, Mon- Monsters and... Um, what am I looking at? Phantomsandmonsters.com. Phantoms and Monsters. That's right, yeah. Um, getting, I just turned 60 here, Larry. Give me a break. Okay. I'm right ahead of you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, in the more, this is a, uh, I guess a mother writing here, and this is, uh, this goes back to 2000. In the morning, I found, I'm quoting here, in the morning I found something in my mouth, so I went to the bathroom, pulled out with my fingers a strange bit of tissue, and uh, apparently organic living animal. It doesn't say more about it. I don't know what it was. I put it in the drain. Then my son walks in the bathroom, and, and to this day it still makes me cry. He said, Mom, I have something in my mouth. I was shocked and horrified to put my fingers in his mouth to find the exact replica logged in between his back teeth and inner cheek, apparently the same sort of organic substance. Uh, have you ever heard of this before? This particular one is a new one on me. I've not heard of anything, anybody waking up with something in their mouth. You, you hear a lot of reports of people waking up, their clothes are on backwards, they've got sand in their feet, uh, there's something to tell you that something happened, uh, but never anything like in their mouth. That's it's you got to wonder what that would be. Well, I have heard of it. Uh, of course, on the other hand, we always give the disclaimer that when people write to us, and many people do with with stories, or when uh, even Lon gets them, you know, there's no there's nothing to guarantee that this is 
not being made up. Uh, on the other hand, when you do hear certain things from from various circles over time, you say, well, maybe, I don't know, who knows, maybe it's still being made up, I don't know, but uh, we just uh, we just reported as we find it here. Uh, but again, I have heard of this sort of thing, and it does sound very similar to, I, 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 I there were three reports that I've had over the years of this kind of thing, and not being a, a UFO researcher, I didn't really feel competent to uh, get back to the person and make a diagnosis. I sort of turned it over to people I knew in MUFON, so... Uh, but again, maybe this is not related to that. There have been similar uh, examples of what we would call in parapsychology apportation, uh, the movement of objects by um, you know, sort of disappearing in one place and appearing in another. And sometimes that even happens to people, apparently, according to reports. But this sort of thing, people apporting things into their mouths, there was a Russian uh, experimental subject who uh, a female who was able to do this in the 1960s and 70s I, her name escapes me right now but uh, apporting food into her mouth was one of the the things she could do so uh, th- this this is known sort of throughout the parapsychological world as well so there we have it let's um don't, 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 i'm sorry go ahead don't don't the yogis in india have the ability to move their fingers and cause some kind of dust to just appear right in their hand i have heard of that happening yes yeah. So is that similar to this apportation you talked about? Well, I believe it probably is. Uh, the move, uh, let, me, let me give you an example, Larry. I, this is kind of amusing in a way. We had a guest who was uh, very, in her book, had a section on how to bend spoons. All right. And uh, now most people don't want to ruin their spoons, but this is sort of an exercise in sort of taking control of your own faculties and all this kind of thing. And a lot of people do it. I swear Ben is doing it unconsciously because half the spoons in our kitchen drawer are, are all mangled, and it's just driving me nuts. And tell him to knock it off. We're going to start using plastic uh, plastic wear here. But in any case, I, I said, okay, well I'm going to try this. So this is one night at my desk, and I work all kinds of nutty hours. I work at home, but I still work nutty hours. And I was down at my desk, and, and uh, I used her technique, which involved sort of touching the uh, the spoon and the, this and that, and sort of concentrating in a kind of an odd way. And nothing happened to the spoon, but all of a sudden my printer can, uh, wouldn't work, and it was making all sorts of strange noises. Uh, the next day I, I, I took it apart, and there was a, a huge safety pin. And we don't even have those in the house. I mean, at least not since Ben was a baby. And it, it was... It totally ruined the print head. So in the end, I had to replace the printer. So I'm, just, you know, I'm wondering. There's no, there's, the, the thing is way up by the ceiling. There's no, nothing it could have fallen from that I could see. So if this was what it appeared to be, I'm wondering if this wasn't an example of apportation uh, inadvertently done, who knows, even by me trying to do this spoon thing. I mean, I, you, there's no way to really tell, as you say, but it was pretty odd, and it's never happened before or since, fortunately. It was ex- an expensive sort of apportation experience. Well, the, the first time that you bend a spoon, I mean, really do it, and it becomes malleable in your hand, it changes your perspective on what the mind is capable of doing. Yeah, have I'm you done that? I've, I've been fortunate that they've been trained to do it. I've got a whole mantle full of really, really bent spoons. No kidding. <laughs> and I was I was skeptical of the business, uh, enough so that I didn't investigate far enough. And that's one of the failures in this thing, is if, you get, if your skepticism takes hold too early, you never get enough information to change your mind, so there you sit. Well, I always, but, well, you, uh, you never ruined a yeah. printer, huh? Well, I've had other situations where people have affected electronic equipment, I believe, essentially through the power of their mind. Interesting. Uh, Can you... Uh, see, well, now, see now, now we're getting into consciousness here. So Somebody want Well, this is all about... I mean, it, when the spoon bends, it, it becomes soft and malleable in an unusual way, and the effect only lasts for about 10 seconds and then it kind of goes back to being a spoon again so there's that's that's some part of it this is a limited period of time and your mind has got to be in the right frame of mind to do it uh-huh. um, but in another case an individual sent me an email and then thought the better of it and in the process of trying to figure out what could be done to make the email not readable by me my entire server went down and consequently it stopped being a server, it crashed. So uh, there's a lot of effects like that, but I'd have to go back and ask, if this happens in the middle of the night with this person, uh, we kind of have to go back to the notion of, if this is an abduction, 
she talks earlier about there being some sort of entity in the in the house prior. Was it a yeah. case that there was uh, like a, you know a sponge left inside the the uh, the patient? Was this something that was an accidentally left, or was somebody trying to send a message? Because it, it feels a little bit more like an external thing than an application. No, oh, perhaps, yeah. yeah. But again, all, all we know is what we have written here from Lon, and that that's just yeah. about it. And all he knows is what he got in the email. But uh, again, you know, having researched things of this kind for many years, I have run into things that are really, really, really difficult to explain. I'm thinking, of course, of the uh, poltergeist outbreak in Bridgeport, Connecticut, in 1974, and it was my first real knockdown, dragout poltergeist. And there, there were apportations going on. There were things moving around. There were. Uh, it was really. Um, quite an experience for the first time out. So uh, anyway, but uh, but it does have to do, uh, as I agree with you, uh, consciousness. L- let me quote something that you sent uh, earlier in the day, uh, Larry. Here, and, and it's uh, uh, this is a quote from uh, who, who, whose quote is this? this? Is about quantum physics. Uh, but every interpretation of quantum physics involves consciousness. Rosenblum and Kuttner, therefore turn to exploring consciousness itself and encounter quantum mechanics. Free will and anthropic principles become crucial issues, and the connection of consciousness with the cosmos, suggested by some leading quantum cosmologists, is mind-blowing. And just for those who don't know, the anthropic principle has to do with the, what seems to be the idea that, that the, the environment in which we find ourselves, even in the solar system, seems ideal for us, unless I'm... I, that, that, that is what the anthropic principle essentially says, is it not, Larry? i take your word for it. Okay, all right. Uh, and free will, the whole idea of free will. Now, now the idea of quantum physics involving consciousness, I think, uh, and Larry, I'm sure you'll probably agree with me, is, is the idea that consciousness, how we know what we know, uh, our self-awareness, things of, things of this kind that are associated with human beings, and I think with probably all life forms, have to do with non-locality. In other words, our consciousness us, our awareness, is not necessarily in our brains, or not just in our brains. It's non-local, according to many of these physicists who research consciousness, which means that it's somewhere out there, shared somehow. And one goes back to what Sigmund, uh, not Sigmund Freud, his student, Carl Jung, said about the collective unconscious. Uh, what say you? Uh, that quote was from a book that I just, just purchased called The Quantum Enigma. Oh yeah, and I've heard of it. Yeah. They talk about uh, the the the, mecha- the mechanisms and facts of quantum mechanics are pretty well known. Guys know how to run the theory. They know how to do the measurements, but they don't look into this spooky action at a distance very far because they run into the notion of consciousness. And most physicists stop. These two physicists that wrote this book uh, take a bold step across that gap, and they say, "Here's what we know." There's ten competing versions of what quantum mechanics might really be, yep. and I'm not going to go through all of them, but they they all involve this this issue that if it's outside, if it's consciousness is a force, and it's outside the human being, and we are a node of it, each one of us is like an individual a node of high concentrated frequencies and patterns of information that is our personality. Now, Paul von Ward talks about the soul genome. That the that part of our DNA is connected to who we actually are, but that that that's empowered by this external force, then I, all bets literally seem to me to be off. Yeah, anything is now possible, and because your reality then becomes what your consciousness makes it to be. That's right. Well, on that happy note, we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back on Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno, This with Larry Lowe sitting in for Ben this evening on WON, 1240 AM in New England's beautiful but hot Blackstone River Valley. Be right back. Hi, I'm Russ Gorman. If you're concerned about 2013, relax. It's actually the 14th year of the 21st century, and a great time to get an astrological chart done. This year, I'm offering an added feature. I'm including lucky numbers on request with each chart or update at no extra fee. Discover what tomorrow will bring in regard to money, health, job, relationships, or possible windfalls. Call me at 401-333-4048 
for information on getting your individual chart or update. Give your life a fresh start. Welcome the changes the planets are providing. I'm also available for private parties and speaking engagements for groups. Look forward to enjoying the future this year. Call me, Russ Gorman, at 401 And we're back, and I must say, I have to disagree with dear old Russ, this really is the 13th year of the 21st century, which began in 2001, not 2000. Anyway, I had a big argument about that with everybody. Anyhow, I wanted to just tell you about two charities that Ben and I have adopted, of the several we have adopted. One is USA Cares, and that provides financial and advocacy assistance to post-9-11 active duty military personnel, veterans, and their families. And in other words, if, if a veteran is hard up for the mortgage that month, out goes a check from USA Cares. It's a great charity, and they are trying to start a chapter here in Rhode Island, and I suggest you check it out, w- USA Cares. Org. And if you are interested in getting involved in this chapter, uh, which would involve uh, just some fundraising and some awareness raising, just call me, 401-527-5345, or write to me at paul at behindtheparanormal.com. I also bring your attention to of our Canadian listeners to Canadian Veterans Advocacy, uh, founded by Mike Blaze. It's a tremendous organization founded in 2010, and check that out at Canadians Veterans, CanadianVeteransAdvocacy.org. Great organization. Okay, let's get back uh, with my co-host here this evening, the distinguished Larry Lowe, and we're talking about the nature of consciousness. Larry, I wanted to uh, sort of pose a question here uh, that, that, that comes up a lot with us. My particular, well, Ben, I suppose, too, if I can speak for my son, we have a very, I suppose, Eastern mentality. We believe that in order to get to the root of things, one must bring things together rather than take them apart, as is customarily done in Western epistemology. And part of this is that uh, we, we're always arguing with the ghost crowd that the physicality of many of these phenomena, you know, seeing ghosts in clothes or driving cars or whatever, as is often reported, is a symptom of the physicality of this, of the nature of this. In other words, I think that they're, they're dealing with people who are in parallel realities, fully clothed in bodies and all this other stuff, not dead people, at least not in the sense that we understand it. So what would you say, I mean, whatever opinion you may have on that, what would you say about the implications of what, what we've said about consciousness for that argument, for the non, in other words, the non-locality of our consciousness, uh, what, is the, what does that do to, our, to the, the physical nature of ourselves? Well, that gets pretty complicated pretty fast, and I'm hard pressed yeah. to just toss off a good response. I should have given you a fair uh, warning on that question. The, no, that's okay. I, I had time to listen to the question. The point is that um, if you've got a phenomenon that everybody can see and perceive, more importantly, if it can be recorded on film or videotape or audio or whatever, then that argues for a objective reality to the phenomenon or everybody's reality is collectively shifted to the place where that phenomenon can be evidenced as physical. And, you know, I obviously don't know the answer to which one of those might be really right. Well, no one no one really does, but I have noticed, if I'm interpreting it, properly, that the more people who concentrate on something, the more action there seems to, to be. Uh, one example was many years ago when I was an editor at the Providence Journal, the Metro Daily around here. There was a, I guess it was the uh, Transcendental Meditation Group met in Providence at the big civic center there, and they held a, a meditation session to bring peace. And half of the people in the newsroom were laughing at this, you know, what a bunch of dopes and all but, you know, I said, not so fast, because within what, within three months, uh, excuse me, six months, there were four major peace treaties, uh, several wars stopped, and a number of good things happened in the world. And I, you know, I, just, I just couldn't help but wonder, were they projecting some sort of consciousness? Were they bringing in, a, I don't know, as a shaman might say, a parallel reality where what we needed already existed? I don't know quite know how to interpret that or, or to verbalize it, but something good happened there. Well, I've heard these reports uh, of groups of people getting together uh, and, and meditating for peace, and then a peace discussion breaks out. And I think I would point to the notion of the morphogenic field. Oh, yeah. 
uh, uh, Sheldrake would claim that there's a field that, and it sounds a lot like the force from Star Wars when you talk about it, there's a field that we're all sort of connected to. Well, one person might not be able to influence it much, but if you get a gaggle of people together and they work, and they concentrate, and they focus, maybe they inject something into that field. And my mantra is that intention is your transmitter and intuition is your receiver. And then the principals that are busy fighting the wars and, and need to make the peace talks might have gotten an, an intuition that now's the time to write to, you know, maybe take a step towards, can we have a conference? Can we sit down? Can we talk about this? Can we bring the war to a halt? So it's entirely possible, uh, you know, under Sheldrake's theory that groups of people collectively could, could cause good things to happen. And then that makes you say, what do we do with our society when we inject into the mind frames of a lot of people the kinds of violence and and the, what we see on the news and what we see in the action movie blockbusters maybe this is a self-perpetuating situation our civilization finds itself in yeah no i agree i i, I get the chills every time i turn on the television set and i i think you're right it's it's a matter of um well this sort of gives new, new meaning to the term you know the world is what we make it it you know? does and so I would also point to the work of um, the lady that did a thing called the Lynn McTaggart did a thing called the Intention Experiment, and listeners might want to you know Google that, get on it, look around because she's she's done a lot of actual serious documented research in this area. The groups of people with an intention can cause something to happen. Yes, and this even gets into the notion that. Uh Dr. Amit Gatswami has has suggested, and other people, and we have suggested too, because this is what I've seen in the paranormal over the years, that there really is no such thing, in the strictest sense, as an individual. We all, in in my philosophy, such as it is, we, we are all unique expressions of all of us, and all of us are unique expressions of each of us. That that, that sort of thing. I just think that there, all, all the the, it's almost goes back to what the Buddha said: all the pain and suffering is caused by the ego because it really doesn't exist it's it's chasing a phantom that, that you know that that just doesn't really have any any reality you know I often compare, yeah, I would, yeah. I, w- I would agree that that we really are trapped by the western sense of self sense of individualism yeah. And, and therefore, materialism becomes important, and I want to have more than the next guy. Then I got to, you know, take it away from him or whatever. And somewhere, somehow, there's an answer that's got to do with quantum entanglement or the morphogenic field, and we are all connected in some way. We don't, we Western people don't realize. Eastern people, I think your point is right. They've gotten this for a long time. They get it. Yeah. Well, I wonder if they're not losing it now because they're becoming Westernized. Well, exactly. Yeah. Well, one one of the things too is the uh, the notion that not, not to get tied up in terms, but individualism, the, the ferocious individualism we see today, it perhaps uh, could be replaced by, I suppose you might call it personalism. It's not my term; I've, it's been around, but uh, it's it's a more tempered form of realizing and respecting the individual, while respecting the fact that the individual is is uh, e- sort of indivisible from the whole. That, that, that sort of thing, you know, philosophically, and I think that, that that's what the paranormal has taught me, at least. You know, so in any case, um, well, let's let's sort of get down into some other stuff here that we're that is, I suppose, beyond the the pale that we usually deal with. Um, thinking of um, the appearance of uh, the supposed appearance of Yeti or Bigfoot in, uh, particularly in England, and I, th- that came to my mind when we were in. The Rendlesham Forest area in September, which our regular listeners are very familiar with, uh, our experience there, pretty weird. And many of the local people who have never been interviewed, you know, as opposed to the U.S. Air Force people who were involved in the, the 1980 uh, UFO situation there, which was quite striking and dramatic, they, uh, they've been interviewed all over the place. But we think that there's something more to this. And just as uh, individuals are not not divorced from each other, neither are paranormal phenomena in our experience. And one of the phenomena going on there besides UFOs has to do with, with what we would call Bigfoot. And person after person after person who stood up at our talk in the, the village of Woodbridge that night in September of last year and talked about their Bigfoot experiences in Rendlesham Forest. 
this creature coming and going in this business. And so I'm looking at another example, a report from East Sussex, which is in um, uh, not really too far from that area. It's in eastern England. And uh, I'll read it here. It says, call it what you will, a Yaren, a Yeti, or a Yowie. That's the Australian term. But the fact remains that people the world over see, I keep seeing these big, hairy uh, buggers lurking in the night. The latest sighting took place recently just north of Bexhill. It's not all that far from London, really. When a, Li- a Lismore resident and music videographer spied the classic creature crossing a moonlit bungalow road. Bangalow Road, I should say. The witness, who was asked not to be named for fear of reprisal, I don't know, from the Yeti or what, said he was driving back home from the night of filming at Eltham and had just turned into the Bangalow Road, heading for Lismore when he spied a creature jumping a barbed wire paddock fence, just briefly pausing at the edge of the road. And not only is Yeti being seen there, but I was over there in 89 researching the so-called Beast of Exmoor, which, in my opinion, was just, I, I, you know, I could just, instead of being some sort of a monster, this seems to be a large panther-like cat, uh, which, of course, is not native to Britain, at least not for several thousand years. And uh, they seem to be black in color, such as, the, like, the South American panthers. And uh, I, I ran into all sorts of reports of these things. I saw everything but the creature itself. The, I was accompanied by some police, and we were, there, was, there had been a sheep kill, and we were finding these huge footprints and all this business, all very feline. Uh, but um, I don't know. I, I, my opinion was that this was sort of a hybrid thing. I could just picture some old colonel from the Raj, you know, coming back from India with, with a black panther or something like this, and uh, letting it go in 1976 when Parliament passed the Animals Act. He couldn't have all these weird animals anymore. And the interbreeding with some of the local lynxes or something, I mean, I suppose that's biologically possible. But that, that's what I seem to run into. And the people who were paying for my trip were rather disturbed that I didn't give them Loch Ness or something like this. They wanted something supernatural, and I didn't think it was. In any case, there are a lot of strange things going on from a cryptozoological standpoint. How would you, do you have any, any sort of theory of consciousness when it comes to cryptids, as it were, Larry? Well, not really. Um, it, it does seem to me that there's, a, a, a likelihood that certain kinds of bizarre species are operating and they're operating at the fringes of society, the fringes of civilization uh, because there's too many reports along that line um, the, down here in the southwest we've got the notion of the skinwalker oh yes uh, and and we've covered that. ranch up in, uh, in Utah that uh, Bigelow invested some money in and a lot of very bizarre stuff went on up there um, and a couple of high-powered physics guys went on the team, and, and they 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 purport, reported a thing that they thought was maybe a wormhole. Um, but I was walking here, right here in Mesa, home one night, um, and I walked around a corner, and I would talk to some kids, and I, I was just, I'm just walking by, and the kid doesn't know me, and he says, "Hey, do you know about the Skinwalker?" No. And I go, yeah, I know about the skinwalker. I read the book. I met the guy. I know the thing. What's the story? He says, well, I saw one last night on the canal bank. And he proceeded to explain bright red eyes, crouching figure, inhuman strength, kind of morphing a little bit between a human and and maybe something else and then disappearing over the fence. And he was legitimately scared. Now, he, he didn't have a photograph. He could have been trying to pull a prank on a passerby we've got to consider that right mm-hmm. uh, but my sense was he wasn't asking because he wanted to start a casual conversation he was scared and he wanted somebody to confirm the possibility that this paranormal event that he'd witnessed could have gone on because to him it seemed like it did <laughs> so you know do we have uh, as McKenna put it other residents in the building are there, are there species that are managing to live just outside the, I mean, bats and opossum. I had an opossum in my backyard in um, downtown L.A., West L.A., and I didn't know that until the middle of the night I got up on time and saw them and they were out. So creatures can live with us and not be seen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's true. So uh, who knows? We're burning up the hour here, Larry, because it's such a fascinating conversation. I wanted to go down your list. Uh, what's going on with the Phoenix Lights? You note the passing of Michael Tanner. You want to talk about that? You can, yes, you can, I think yeah. the one thing that we would be remiss in talking about the Phoenix Lights, uh, if we didn't give uh, some respect to Michael Tanner, who was a member of the original uh, ad hoc 
investigation process that went on at a place called Village Labs, and he collected over the years a lot of uh, material. Uh, he actually appeared on the episode I did for um, National Geographic, and it's a shame uh, he was gone too soon. Apparently, apparently, some kind of crime. Um, and oh, that's, but the, and we kind of don't know exactly where all the material that he collected will end up. But uh, he was a he was a force in the in the community, and, and he's gone here a few months back. Oh, that's a shame. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, what is going on with the Phoenix Lights as such? Anything? Nothing hot. I mean, you know, you get you get reports every now and again from around the valley. I think there's a lot of activity down uh, south of the mountain, down in Ahwatukee, Maricopa, in that area. People are constantly talking about, you know, the orange orbs are there. Yeah, this the uh, lights in the sky, the by the way, if anybody out. doesn't know what they are, yeah. Okay. There's some activity out on the west, northwest end of town at the White Tanks. That's always been a hot place. Mm -hmm. But there haven't been any big striking events of late. It's, it's a cold case for all intents and purposes. Okay. All right. Um, let's um, look at this quote you sent. I believe it was uh, Mary Rodman. Uh, Ma Mary Rodman fished out. Rod, 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 well, or Rodman. I don't know. Rodwell. Thank Rodwell, you okay. Rodwell. All right. It's actually from Thomas Cohn, author of The Structure of Scientific Revolution. Do you want to read it or do you want me to? Well, I can read it. Um, just observe. Drop all your preconceived categories as best you can and just collect raw information. Don't even use words like happened or didn't happen, exist or doesn't exist, inside, out, inside outside, real or unreal. Just put that all aside and collect raw data, unquote. You know, and, and this, that, this is what we're always saying, you know, like get rid of the assumptions. We get so frustrated because so many, even guests who are supposed to be eminent researchers have all these anthropomorphic assumptions, you know, or anthropocentric, I should say. You know, in other words, a human-centered framework from which to judge these things. Go ahead, Larry. Well, and there's a scientific framework, and uh, Sheldrake spoke about this in this uh in this talk he gave recently that uh, to the uh, TED people that they got so irritated by, they took down and censored him. Yeah, Rupert because Sheldrake we're talking about, right? Yeah, he's going to be on the show in a few months. Oh, well, you got you to listen to his, his, uh, his TED talk because he says there's ten dogmas of science that we believe, we think we know, or the scientists folks believe they think they know. And so then they project upon the data those assumptions unconsciously without even before they even start and the, as I'm trying to unravel some kind of comprehension for a model of how things work it, it, it struck me don't use words like exist or doesn't exist that's that's a chewy thing to have to try to actually do and to say what appears to have occurred is and that's as far as we can go. And you find yourself, if you if you get rigorous in this mode, you find yourself mincing your words back in very, very tightly and saying, all I know is, and then some recantation of the facts as provided by the witness. Well, this is what I'm always saying, that, our, that human language, no language that I'm aware of, is really up to uh, just to even talking about this stuff, never mind defining it. The language well, seems think, to be a problem. I think the problem is that science then immersed in its model of how things are, me mechanistic, everything's deterministic, yep. it all can be reduced to atoms. And Materialist, right? yeah. They cannot have a picture in their mind of how weird reality might really be. <laughs> That's true. So language, they're not even going to get to the language because they can't even come up with a concept to try to express because they've already got it figured out it all boils down to classical physics and then quantum physics if you go that far yeah it's true uh, this brings us of course to this paper by Jacques Valley and Eric Davis uh, Jacques Valley someone I wish I had known uh, incommensurability orthodoxy and the physics of high strangeness a six layer model for anomalous phenomena which extrapolates at great length upon what we've just said so, well Eric Davis uh, was with uh, the group that that looked at Skinwalker Ranch. He's a well-known physicist. Oh, that's where I've heard that. Yeah, 
Jock Vallee, of course, worked with Heineck, and he was a computer scientist, and they're both very well educated. They know how to do a research paper. And in 2003, they put together a thing and said, you know what, if we really want to understand this phenomenon, many of them, the very notion of the paranormal, we need to start doing essentially what this quote said, just look at the data we've got and consider it in the following. They've got four or five layers, and there were two that I was interested in, one of which pertains to UFOs, and that's the level two. Yes. And that's where objects do things that are physically impossible to do. They grow, they shrink. Uh, you get a little tiny object that you're looking at, and when you walk into it, all of a sudden you're in a gigantic blimp hanger. There's topo- topography inversion. Uh, sudden 90 degree right turns at Mach 18 with no shock wave and no noise. That stuff is outside the realm of physics somehow. And they say, let's study all of that. The other thing is Section 5, and if you've got the piece in front of you, that looks like your bailiwick. Yes, uh, it does, but, yeah. Exactly. What, what, what are some of the items on that list? Well, this is, uh, we got the fifth category of effects here. and They're talking about impressions of communication without a direct sensory channel poltergeist phenomena, which we've talked about this evening, motions and sounds without a specific cause outside the observed presence of a UAP, which is we would might think of as a uh, UFO, um, levitation of the witness or of objects and animals in the vicinity. I've actually seen that. Maneuvers of a um, UAP, unidentified aerial phenomenon. Is that what that yeah. stands for? Okay. Uh, appearing to... Uh, anticipate the witness's thoughts and, and we've had some interesting reports on that uh, premonitory or, or you might want to say uh, premonitions uh, dreams or visions personality changes promoting unusual abilities in the witness that just came up in a discussion I was having with another UFO expert with um, uh, about certain areas uh, Mac Maloney whom you may know uh, on our CBS show last night talking about certain areas where, where people can can visit and they, they come out knowing uh, I don't know, differential calculus when they flunked it in high school, this sort of thing. And the last item is healing. So these are, these, here we get into certain areas of the paranormal that usually are not touched by UFO researchers, but perhaps should be. Well, exactly. And, and I'm going to catch uh, some heat from this. But in a sense, I think the, the old school uh, nuts and bolts, let's just get the documentation and prove there's a cover-up UFO community. Uh, is as hidebound in their narrow perception of what they think they're trying to figure out as the hard science community is in saying, well, paranormal doesn't exist and consciousness is not on our watch. And, and we're not going to get anywhere until we look at this whole range that, that Ballet and Davis have put together and say, hmm, how could a new model of reality uh, accommodate all of these things? Because there's enough evidence that they go on although in any given case there's never enough evidence that you can you know go, go rewrite the, the science book well this is so what i think the, that's the issue we've got to have a new model of reality what say you oh i absolutely agree absolutely agree and i'm thinking of of uh louisa ryan who was one of my mentors back in the 70s uh she and her husband joseph b ryan of course the, the great pioneers of modern parapsychology at duke university starting in the 1930s they had they ran into this very paradigm from other scientists well you know there's not a there's statistical probability you can't prove it there's nothing you can put your finger on and on and on and on and in a way parapsychology is still putting up with that and they're sort of still hunting for their souls they're attempting to do so now in many cases through transpersonal psychology but that's not really in in the, the spotlight for most scientists either so uh, I, as this extrapolation on this paradigm here that this whole scientific uh, structure that does not allow for things that are obviously happening is is a problem as you say and I think this paper is brilliant I look forward to reading the whole thing I only got it today well, but the uh, paper amounts to the definition of an Apollo program to investigate the paranormal Yes, I think so. And, and it's a recipe for what we really ought to do. And it's a decade later, and we, we're not another inch down the road. And why, you know, if a serious society wanted to get some real answers to this thing, you would fund a, a, a project and staff it and, and break down the taboo about hard science guys looking at these things and saying, look, let's, let's open up our minds, get out of our, our cage, and let's look at all of these things. We can see how they get together. And uh, my hats off to these two guys. They, they oh, absolutely, man. Well, they there's a roadmap, but nobody's driving. 
Well, that's true. There's another level to this as well, and this has come up recently on the show, and uh, you kind of put your finger on it. There are deeper issues with attempting to study this stuff because it's not static. Uh, paranormal phenomena, they change. A perfect example is uh, when we had Ted Phillips on a few weeks ago. He was, and it, it, when he was on in 2010, he was also pointing out that the nature of, uh, in this case, UFO, uh, UFOs themselves it seems to be changing. They're almost universally from time immemorial through the 1940s or 50s and even 60s was you know, sort of the usual experience was that of nuts and bolts craft with legs and they'd land and you could find, you know, pad marks on the ground and all this business. Even at Randallsham, that was supposedly was the case. But uh, more recently, he said it, it's been changing to uh, at least the reports he's getting. And Ted Phillips has probably the greatest database of UFO landing evidence uh, oh, yeah. in the world. And oh, he yeah. was saying that you're seeing, people are seeing more balls of light. His own work at what he refers to as Marley Woods, a, a tract of land in Missouri, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, Larry, uh, it has to do a lot with these, these uh balls of light he personally interprets those or at least most of them as uh, some sort of surveillance or monitoring devices from somebody or somewhere and uh, now as one who has a background in, in research on, on ghost phenomena i would say aha you know the the, the uh, ubiquitous orb that you see in different cases i've seen them with the naked eye they followed me around they act Sometimes like ball lightning, they act so intelligently, sometimes very intelligently. They change colors and this sort of thing. So, again, depending on the context, I might see it if I'm running around in the woods or in a cemetery or something, which I don't usually do, uh, or in a house. Aha, you know, some sort of um, uh, plasma-based life form. There's something like this having to do with the phenomenon. Or if you see it in your backyard, hovering over the yard with it, maybe somebody underneath it, aha, uh -huh, an alien craft or something like this. And uh, Ted, Ted acknowledges this is a problem, depends on the context. But this seems to be a, sort of a changing nature of UFOs. Are you seeing that? Well, indeed. Uh, in the 1890s, uh, what everybody was seeing was an airship out of a General's Burn novel going right. down the West Coast, across the Southeast, up the Mississippi River, through Chicago, and out across the Northeast. Uh, and we've seen these these periods of time when a whole set of reports of a similar nature come in, and then you know a decade later they change, or you go to South America, and all of a sudden the culture down there is such that the kinds of reports seem to be different. What I'm curious about is the notion that perhaps the entity or the object it itself is, in its pure form, a ball of consciousness energy. And when, but when we get around to the point where they just show up as orbs, we're actually perceiving the thing as it actually is, and all of these other prior versions of it would be some form of screen masking, mind uh, filtered version of what was permissible to be understood. And I think the 1890s is very important because everyone was reading Jules Verne. No, I agree. It's certainly true. The very definite possibility. We're almost out of time here, and we've got to get ready for the okay. uh, the. The Boston Bruins Chicago Blackhawks game coming pregame show coming up at seven o'clock, folks. So don't Excellent. you really want to be uh, on the edge of your seat? Don't listen to us. Listen to that game. Anyway, Larry, uh, I want to give you a chance to talk again about your website, your work, and tell people where they can find out more about you. Uh, I'm operating as a Phoenix UFO Examiner. I'm not publishing a lot. I recently did a uh, piece for a television program that will be on Discovery Channel. Uh, out of Canada on the Phoenix Lights next year, um, Neat, yep. and if you if you know, you can catch me on Facebook. Great. Okay. And Larry, I, we always have fascinating. Larry and I, for a long time, it's, uh, were involved in sort of a roundtable phone discussion with a number of interesting people, some of whom you may have heard of. Uh, and I just, I could never tear myself away from conversations with Larry. But in any case, uh, so Larry, uh, I, did I ever tell you that I saw the Phoenix Lights from an airplane? No. Okay. Uh, ben and I were on our way to San Diego. This is 08. Ben and I were on our way to San Diego to do a program there. And uh, we were flying over Phoenix, one of those red-eye flights. And uh, Phoenix is unmistakable from the air. And there were three, a row of three lights. One disappeared. One came back. Another one seemed to land. This is, this is west of the city. 
and uh, they just looked just like the photographs I saw. And I spent a lot of time in the military. I, I didn't. And you, you're a pilot, so you know what a flare looks like. This is not what these look like. Uh, it's very difficult. We were about, of course, 33,000 feet or so. It was very difficult to to tell how high they were. I would I would venture a guess, probably about 10,000. But it's you know, especially at night, it's tough. And uh, we got to San Diego, and sure enough, the next day, uh, the, in the paper there, it said that they had seen the Phoenix lights west of the city that night. Uh, it was in February. I can't remember the exact date. But uh, I thought the, so, but people tell me, wow, that they've never had a report from an airplane before <laughs> a commercial flight, albeit for just a few minutes. Well, there were some reports from airborne pilots that night, not very many, and they're not very well distributed. But I think the more important point is this phenomenon seems to have been going on uh, to some degree around Phoenix for a long time, and it continues to go on. It's just that on March 13th, 1997, there was an awful lot of very large black objects roaming around uh, in addition to the, to the, the light orbs that we see. And that, that was an event. Indeed. There's something, more, there's something more going on here. What, in your opinion, is it? Let me, let me add to that before um, you answer. Yeah, you tell me. Okay, I, I, I've been told by uh, two prominent people we know. They've both been on the show. One is uh, Dr. Lin Kitai uh, and also um, uh, a few others that they feel it is a very positive phenomenon. They feel great peace when they see these things. Uh, it's almost moon bat stuff, you know, and, and I, I didn't particularly feel any great peace when I saw the things. I was extremely interested. But uh, there seems to be, a, in, from the exopolitics movement, the people who believe, I think, something that, that might go against the paper we were just referring to, because it sort of is very anthropocentric and assumes that, that these people, if that's what they are, uh, aliens, if you will, are on our level, are willing to talk to us diplomatically, and uh, we consider us their equals, which I think is a very, very dubious proposition. So they they think this is what this is. It's a signal uh, that they're here to help us or whatever, and I think that's awfully naive. I don't know about you. Well, I'm just very, very cautious about coming up with the answers to questions like you just asked. Yes, yes. You know, wisely I, I so. Exactly what it is. Yeah. All, all, all I know is it is, and that's, a, that's enough. You know, that's a leap a lot of people need to make. It is. It's, there is a phenomenon. Yeah, no, that, that's quite true. Uh, Lin Kitai sent me a video that was really kind of strange. There were num a number of videos, actually, and one of them had an air, what was clearly a small airplane, like a Piper or something, with um, three triangular, a, a triangular set of lights underneath it. And I said, whoa, what's this? You know? And she, I asked her, she said, well, that was some, somebody did some kind of experiment or something like that. I mean, it, uh, what, is this some of this at least a hoax or what? Well, it, there's, there's an awful lot of misperception going on. Uh, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and admit out loud. I, the other night I was walking around, and uh, I'm pretty well aware of what their traffic is coming in over from um, Williams, and I saw, to my surprise, three big orange orb-like lights and then they would blink off and I moved around a little bit and I thought for a moment oh my yeah well, oh, I'm afraid I'll have to stop you there with an oh my because we're just about out of time I wanted to uh, uh, thank of course our producer uh, the great Steve Bianchi and of course our wonderful co-host this evening Larry Lowe my good friend and uh, next week July 1st I will be co-hosting with uh, I don't know yet we'll see uh, working on a few people and the subject is uh, open for debate as well. So get your questions in now to paul at behindtheparanormal.com on any paranormal topic, or use the question form at our show site, behindtheparanormal.com. Results are not guaranteed based, of course, on what Larry said tonight. These questions, some of them are very difficult, if not impossible, to answer. And on a CBS radio edition of the show on Sunday, June 30th, in Boston, Pittsburgh, Detroit, Windsor, and Seattle, Vancouver, and on radio.com, Paul and Ben will host an open line show on many different paranormal topics. Okay, there you go. Get the questions in for that, too. We leave you this evening with a thought from our dear old friend Albert Einstein. Once we accept our limits, we go beyond them. I'm, oh, we got another minute. I'm doing it again. Well, let, let's hold it right there. And, uh, Larry, I'm going to give you the last word, as they say. What say well, you? I got, the perfect, I got the perfect last word. I was walking down the street, and I thought, oh, ha, I've seen the Phoenix Lights. 
and upon further investigation, it turned out to be street lights that I did not know that were posted recently <laughs> on large poles. Isn't that something? It's amazing how many reports of these things have to do with phenomena. That I, I've even people have even reported the moon as being a, anyway. Yeah. So there, there are so many questions associated with these things. It's best to keep your feet on the ground, uh, yeah. your eyes on the sky, and uh, your head, your brain, and your head. That sort of thing, you know. Because uh, do not check your brain exactly. at the door with this stuff. So anyway, again, once we accept our limits, we go beyond them. I'm Paul Eno, and I'm Larry Lowe. Thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.